Hey everybody, welcome back to the Karen Conference, Our Resilient Spirit. And our next presenter is Carlos and he's gonna help us find resilience in the present moment. Carlos, take it away. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for being here and thanks Denise again for the invite. So my talk today is finding resilience in the present moment. So uh, before we start, I kind of want to set the tone a little bit. And with that in mind, um, I want to show this heart. I think this heart is something that's going to be a theme throughout all this. And you'll understand why um, as I keep speaking. Um, so um, I approached this talk with this spirit. Um, I saw the Tom Hanks movie, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, um, when it opened. And what's one of the things that struck me um, is not only am I a big uh, Tom Hanks fan, um, I'm also a big Mr. Rogers fan. And there's a scene in it, um, in case you haven't seen it, I'll explain what um, the scene is. He's ta talking to this reporter, uh, Lloyd Vogel, who he is the subject of an interview. And that's kind of like the crux of the movie, along with uh, Lloyd Vogel's relationship with his dad. And said he, Tom Hanks, Mr. Rogers says that he's approached um, the interview. Um, he considers Lloyd Vogel, this reporter, um, as his friend. And he goes like this, and I'd never seen this before. He says, this is what friend means in sign language. So it's basically, if you see it, it's two, two C's basically hooked together. And it's like the fingers are hugging each other. So I approach this as your friend and, and I give you a virtual hug. And in these days, um, that's a lot, you know, because we oftentimes we can't hug each other. But what I mean by that is um, I'm, I'm on your side. Like I get um, caring, I get what it means to be resilient. Um, and so in terms of our hearts, what, one of the things I, I hope um, we do is understand um, the present moment. So with that in mind, I want us to kind of um, quiet ourselves and I want you, if you can, to close your eyes and just put your hand on your heart and just feel your heart beating. So I'll, I'll be silent and I'll do this myself. And so it'll last maybe 20, 25 seconds so we can all feel our hearts. So thank you for indulging me there. Um, so I, I want to check in. I, I want to see how some of you are doing. And I, and I realize that there are some extroverts in here and there's some introverts. And so I'm trying to tap into the extroverts. So this is, this is a, a legit question that I'm asking. I really want to know, uh, first of all, when you did that, how did it feel? And also, I want you to just say, um, how are you doing in general? Because it's really important for me to understand, kind of take a pulse of, of who I'm speaking to. So if anyone wants to unmute themselves, um, hopefully it's an extrovert and introvert too, I don't care, but usually the extrovert step up and just say, how did it feel to feel your heart, um, to be that quiet? And also just how are you doing? Someone said, uh, love the heart touch, need 10 minutes of that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, if anyone wants to speak up, well, again, just unmute yourself. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, I, I'm an introvert, but <laughs> I said, why not? Thank you so much. For Putting no, the no, extroverts to shame. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. I'm confident, but uh, I don't usually talk much, but... I thought maybe I should. So my name is Bilal Khan and I'm from Pakistan. And welcome. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So I'm a student uh, in a university and I'm studying bachelor's marketing, HR. It's my final year. And other than that, I'm just, you know, uh, because it's my final year, I'm mostly studying. Uh, looking at different topics, what to learn, you know. I have a future uh, right around the corner. So, you know, I need to prepare for that. 
That's so, awesome. So how did you feel that yeah. the whole thing about touching your heart, just to be quiet and to feel your heartbeat? I stay silent all day. And, you know, I'm just uh, with myself and I'm thinking about, you know, you know, just, it's not just I'm uh, doing it right now. I just do it all day, I think, for hours. That's wonderful. So, so thank you for sharing that. I appreciate your courage sure. there. Um, <clears throat> and and um, someone else just wrote, it makes me feel more centered and present in the moment. So Julia, thanks, thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate that. Thank you all for that feedback. I, I really it was sincere in trying to figure out what, how you all are doing. So um, this, this next uh, slide says, um, what helps us, um, let's see here, what helps us to make us resilient? So that's part of this talk, basically. Um, it, it combines two things. One is resilience and, and present moment. And so I, I looked up some of the um, factors that are involved in resilience. And you all could read, read that at your leisure. Um, but resilience, the definition means basically to rebound or to bounce back or to, be, um, to have a sense of elasticity. And as we all know, during these times of COVID, during these months, a lot of us have had to really tap into that because things have been really uh, crazy and, and different at times. So we've needed to adapt to our, our new normal. And so what does that mean? Um, what, what does it mean to be resilient? And especially what does it mean to be resilient in the present moment? So I wanted to share with you a personal story of mine, something that happened in my life. <clears throat> I was trying to look for an example of this on the internet. And then I said to myself, why should I get someone else's story? I know my story. And so this is a really powerful story I'm going to share. <clears throat> and in it, you'll see several factors of resilience in this example of, of what I'm going to share, where um, I faced my fear, where I relied on this moral compass, where I drew on my faith. Um, part of, I, I, I'm, I still exercise a lot. I'm 56, um, so I'm physically fit. Um, I, I have cognitive and emotional flexibility. Um, I have realistic optimism. So all those factors were really helpful for me in this example um, of what I'm about to talk to you about. And ultimately, what, what I'm, how I'm going to frame it is, it all deals with time. And if we look at time, obviously, time is really important. You know, we look at our watches. Um, I, I knew that this meeting was going to happen today at 10 o'clock. That was a very um, present um, um, uh, part of my life that I knew I had to block off this 50 minutes. And so we understand that, but ultimately time is just that. It's, it, it's, it, it belongs here. So what do, what do I mean by that? So here's this example of, of how I use resilience using the power of the present moment. And I have to set the background first and the background is kind of sad to be quite frank. So there's my sister Rose. I have two sisters, one of whom died of cancer at the age of 45 in 2005. And my other sister, as you can see there, died recently in 2019 in Maryland. Um, the cause of her death was something really tragic and really kind of um, random, basically. So she and my nephew, her son, were um, at an event in D.C. the night of Halloween of 2019. And then uh, on the way uh, back home, uh, they parked in their driveway. They live in a heavily wooded area in Silver Spring. And my sister said to her nephew, to her son, uh, my nephew, hey, Dylan, let's just hang out in the car because there was such a horrible storm that night. The wind was so fierce and the rain was so um, uh, much drenching that Rose just wanted to hopefully settle down a little bit before they made the run from their car to their home, which was maybe like a 20, 25 yard uh, distance. And so during that time, they're talking, they're listening to music, and then all of a sudden, 150 foot red oak tree uprooted <clears throat> and fell. And you can see these pictures give the graphic um, examples of what happened to their car. If you look at the right side of the car, which is the passenger side, that's the side where my sister was sitting. Um, now this is the front. So 
the driver's side, which is the right side on, on this picture as you're looking at it, that's where my nephew was. As you can see, it ballooned up when the tree hit. And, and so he was spared. He literally was not touched. He was unharmed. As you can see from that picture and the other two pictures, um, it crushed her. It severed her spinal cord. It caused um, severe brain damage. And uh, even though the paramedics were there four minutes later, um, they took her to the hospital that night and she died. So the next morning I flew in from where I live near Chicago um, and you know, looked at this scene, took those pictures. And then the funeral was a week later, um, a week to that, on that Friday, a week um, after that Friday. So the previous night of the funeral, um, my, my sister's friends, uh, three of them flew in from Florida, which is where she used to live. So um, the, the, they needed someone to pick them up. I volunteered because it was her friends and I felt obligated and I knew them all too. So it was at night, the flight was coming into BWI, which is in Baltimore. Now, so one thing you have to understand about me, my night vision has never been good. And the older I get, the worse it gets. Also that night, there had been a rainstorm. So the roads were slick and it was a little bit cold. It wasn't icy, but it was cold. So the roads were kind of slick. I've never driven from Silver Spring to the airport, um, that airport. Obviously I had GPS, um, but still it'd still be new. The other thing that was occurring is, is that people were texting me, the people who were reviving, there were three of them were texting me um, while I was in the car driving there. So, the other thing that was weighing on my mind was the time that I was about to pick them up was essentially the same time that the tree fell on her a week to the day that day. So I, I was driving on a Thursday night. The previous Thursday is when the tree fell on her. So all this was playing on my mind. And then the last thing, the final straw basically was I was driving a car that I'd never driven before. The tree crushed all three of my sister's cars. She had, she and her son had a car and her husband had a car. And when the tree fell, it, it demolished all three in their driveway. So I was driving the, my brother-in-law's father's car, which was an old car. It was a huge car. I'm used to driving a smaller car. And the brakes were these old kind of school brakes that you really had to press down on it in order to break. So all this unfamiliarity um, made me extremely, extremely anxious um, to the point where it just was in my head, like all those things. It was a huge jumble in my head. And so as I'm driving, this is not the ideal way to drive, especially when you have no idea where you're going, especially when your night vision is bad, especially when people are texting you. So the first thing that I did, though, to calm down was I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've been working on trying to be present in the present moment for the past year. So since 2018, and I'll get to the reason why later. So for a year, every day basically, I've been really working on that. And the reason um, was to ba basically not project too much in the future and not to be bogged down too much in the past. So in, in understanding that, my, my stress level went from here and it just gradually went down, 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 down. And I said to myself, wait a minute, let me just be in the moment. And so in the moment, I was driving, I had a car, had the GPS, I knew where I was going. Um, and, and so, yeah, it was not ideal, but I still could drive the car well. I still was able to brake. I could still see the road. So I just calmed down. And so I was at peace. I picked up the people at the airport. On the drive back, I'm going on the highway, I think it's 95, and I'm going the speed limit, which is, uh, I think, 60 miles an hour there. All of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a deer. A deer was crossing the highway. There were four lanes on the, on the road that I was on, the highway that I was on. I wasn't on the most left lane. I was on the net lane next to, next to that. So out of the corner of my eye, I see this deer coming and he's crossing the highway and he crosses the name next to me. And as he's coming, I'm saying to myself, oh my gosh, 
I'm going to hit that deer or that deer is going to hit me just based on the trajectory. And so I did defensive driving. I swerved to the right. Luckily, there wasn't a guy behind me. You have to realize that all this was pretty split second. It's not like I saw this deer a mile ahead. It was all bang, bang, bang like that. So I swerved to the right. I braked. And that swerve and that break helped me to slow down enough so that when the deer hit the car and he did hit the car, he hit the side of it. And I felt it. I mean, I literally felt it because I'm on, I'm on that, that side of where he hit me. And he bounced off the car. He sheared off. And you can see this picture here. You can see, if you look closely, that rear view mirror, it's gone. He sheared that off. Um, you can't see the dent there, really. But there was a dent. It wasn't big, but it was, it was enough. And so I looked in the other rear view mirror, not the, not the one to the left of me, but above me. And I tried to see what happened behind me. I didn't see any cars pile up. So whatever happened, thank God the other cars behind me, because this is a busy highway. There wasn't a big uh, crash or wreck up uh, or, or pile of cars wrecked behind me. But the good news is that the deer didn't go through my windshield, because obviously if that had happened, I, I may not be speaking to you. But the interesting thing, the interesting thing about all this is that while all this happened, I and my three friends, uh, my, the three friends of my sister were having a normal conversation. When all this went down, it went boom, 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 bang, 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 like that. Um, the conversation continued and my voice is as calm now as it was then. I did not change my inflection. I did not freak out. They didn't freak out. And I asked them later, why didn't you guys like freak out when the deer hit, hit us? And they said, because you were so calm, we remain calm. And I really believe the reason why I was so calm was because how I centered myself after that initial burst of anxiety. And I just said to myself, wait a minute, if I don't project, because basically earlier what I was projecting was I was going to get into an accident. I was going to die like my sister did a week earlier. It was going to be horrific. Um, I eliminated from that mind, my mind, and I just stayed in the moment, dealing with whatever was in front of me, but not being anxious about it, basically, because there was nothing to be anxious about. And when the deer hit my car, I wasn't anxious because I was already in that mode. And like I said, for a year daily, I had been working on be in the moment, be in the moment, don't project, don't be bogged down by what happened. So the deer hit the car. There was really no damage other than the sheared off rear view mirror. He didn't go through the window. So I wasn't anxious about that, which had just happened. What was present was I was still alive. Um, the three friends of my sister were still alive. So essentially life was good. So basically, what does all that mean? What that means is only now is real. I mean, it, it sounds really simple and it, and it sounds kind of like crazy to think about how simple that is, but that's it. Because I don't know what's gonna happen in the future. I don't know what's gonna happen uh, two minutes from now or an hour from now or tomorrow. I do know what happened yesterday. And of course I can think about it, but my hope is, is not to dwell too much on it if it was negative or positive, because I have to deal with what's going on right now. And so um, one, of the, one of the ways that's helped me, obviously, is this quote really says it all, basically. Um, and again, what, what he's talking about there is um, if, you're, if you're too weighed down by stuff that's happened in the past, um, or if you're just wondering too much about what's going to happen in the future, you're going to be um, affected by that. And it's going to make your presence and your effectivity in the present moment, it could affect it in different ways that may diminish your capacity, not only as a human, but as a caregiver, um, as a um, you know, sibling in all the different ways that life, we intersect with other people in our lives. So this is one of the reasons why I love uh, practicing this. Um, you know, a lot of people call it mindfulness and, and that's a correct term to, to use basically. Um, and, and here's a great image of, of what that looks like in our lives when we look at it. We can see the jumble of when our minds are full. And then we can 
look of what happens when our minds are mindful, which is basically, um, again, trying to stay in the moment and dealing with whatever is going on in that moment. Um, and and um, this next quote also talks about um, just, just that kind of beauty of, of what happens in the moment. And the, the, the reflection about nature that he makes um, is something that's a real powerful, um, um, has a powerful impact and it resonates deeply with me only because in, in my daily walk in terms of trying to be present, I really, really find that um, not only easier, but easier to access in me when I'm in nature, um, when I'm silent in nature and looking around and just seeing the gloriousness of what's around me. And I'm able to kind of capture that kind of like a snapshot in my mind. And then when I'm in a different environment, like say, for example, at an office space, I'm able to kind of recapture that and just transfer that into that. So I may not have the green earth, you know, the trees or the, the blue sky to look at, but that piece that I experienced there, I try to recapture that basically um, when, when I'm inside or, or in a different environment, like I said, where um, I'm not encountering like kind of like that beauty of, of what's around me. So I, I wanted to offer kind of practical tips. Um, this is this is things that have helped me on my journey, and I'm hoping that it could kind of help you in yours. And I'm, again, I'm bringing up this image of the heart because I think that's the heart is such an important part of anything that we do in our lives. And that exercise that we did earlier, where I asked you guys to pause, um, that's really important, and it's something that you can do throughout the day when you feel some type of stress or you're, you're feeling some type of projection into the future, or you're thinking about something that's happened in the past, maybe something sad or tragic, my recommendation is, is be aware of your heart. And it could literally be as simple as putting your hand on your heart, being silent and listening, not only to um, what's around you um, without any kind of um, projection, but just, just being aware Doing, doing something that humans should be good at, which is human being rather than human doing. And in that silence, not only feeling your heart beat, but also just understanding that um, what's important there. And I'll get to that in a second, which is gratitude. But let's do that again, because someone had said that earlier. You know, I wish I could, you know, do this for 10 minutes. Let's again, recenter ourselves and be present. So if you can, and closing your eyes really helps. If you can just close your eyes, be quiet, put your hand on your heart and just feel your heartbeat and just feel that blood flowing and just, just be. Notice that you you probably felt um, a lot of things. That you probably felt too your your breath, and that's something that's um, really important um, in terms of centering yourself, um, breathing. <laughs> um, you know, as 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 something that we often take for granted, um, but but that really helps you to, to just regain that centeredness that oftentimes we lose as we go through the hamster wheel of our lives, just running, running, running. Um, now here's something else. It's called the duty of the moment. And that's something that um, um, I picked up that phrase from this uh, French Jesuit priest who was alive in the 1700s. Um, he had a book that he called Div Abandonment to Divine Providence. And it's really helped me in my journey to, um, to be present in the present moment. He used this phrase and he called it the sacrament of the present moment. Now it's not a real sacrament per se, but he, he thinks that the present moment is, is something that's so precious that he sees it as sacred. And so in that present moment, um, one of the things that he really harps on is something that he refers to as the duty of the moment. Well, what does that mean? Well, 
let's say you're um, a janitor, maybe the duty of your moment is to clean a toilet or mop a floor. So those things in your mind may not be the most exciting things that happen in your life, but it also happens to be the thing that you're tasked to do at that moment. Um, for let's say a mother, it could be her baby's crying. So she needs to pick up that baby and try to um, pacify it or give it food or change his, diaper, his or her diaper. And so in those moments, that's the mom's duty of the moment. So in each of those duties, we can do them mindlessly, meaning thinking about stuff that we need to do tomorrow in an hour from now, or think about something that's happened in the past. And again, it could be sad, it could be happy, um, it could be tragic, um, it could be something that fills us with shame. All those things kind of take away from the duty of the moment, because in that moment, there could be stuff that could be happening. And again, you may not think of mopping as being beautiful or changing a diaper as being beautiful. But at the same time, if you focus on what you're doing in that moment, I guarantee you that you're going to figure out all the blessings that are, are in that moment, even though on the surface, there may not be any blessings. And if you don't think that that's possible, my challenge for you is to break down your day into whatever it is you're doing and then doing it as the duty of the moment, but doing it fully present. And I guarantee you, not only will you be full of peace, um, probably joy, but you'll uh, figure out some of the blessings that are going on in your life at that moment. And again, you can only do that um, if you focus on whatever it is that's in front of you, which is another way of saying multitasking, although it sounds great on the surface, is, is a great killer in terms of um, us not doing things well and pulling us in so many different directions that causes stress in our life and oftentimes doesn't make us do whatever it is that we need to be doing at that moment, the duty of the moment, well. Um, so I love this image of water and I'm reminded of, of this image um, because of uh, something that Bruce Lee, the martial artist said. He has this quote where he talks about be water <laughs> and it's, it's a really simple sentence, um, but what does that mean? Um, it, it, it's, it's profound in the sense that he took it to mean um, that water, when it flows, it basically becomes whatever uh, it needs to be in that moment. So if you pour it into a bottle, the water becomes bottle. Um, if, you become, if you pour water into a cup uh, to make tea, it becomes that cup. If it flows over rocks, um, it's able to go over the rocks in the way that it's supposed to go over the rocks in order to, um, um, to, to um, um, uh, just keep flowing and going in the direction that it needs to go. And I, I, love, I love this quote, and that's from that priest that I was telling you about. Um, and, and basically what this means is, again, that concept of being water, of basically being so um, free that in that moment that you're not um, being torn apart by whatever it is that you think uh, is going to happen, or you're wondering about what's going to happen, or you're worrying about what's going to happen. And, and that quote really inspires me to, to get to that kind of level of what we need to do in order to just be. <laughs> and I, I use the phrase, I think of it as just being water and such a great visual Another, another tip that I use in order to be present is to go the speed limit. And so what does that mean? So um, I'm, I'm kind of known, um, at least when I was younger, to always be in a rush. I always had to be somewhere. And whatever it is that I had to be, I needed to be there fast. Sometimes because I was running late. Sometimes because I just perceived that I was going to be late. So whatever the case, I would speed a lot. I got a, a couple of speeding tickets as a result. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed is that when you rush, 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 you're not in the moment. There's no way you can be in the moment because you're kind of projecting yourself. You're kind of hurtling toward the future without being there in the moment, basically. So what I try to do now is the mantra I have in my head is go the speed limit. 
because if you go the speed limit, you're not speeding. And if you go the speed limit, you, you actually can kind of see what's around you. And I've actually done that when I've driven the car, like as, as an exercise, when I go the speed limit, I actually see what's around me. And usually if it's like 30, 35 miles an hour, as opposed to maybe the 45 or 50 that I would normally do, um, huge difference in terms of what I see along the side of the road or in front of me. And then there's also a huge difference in terms of my life just by that slowing down. And obviously when I asked you to put your hands over your hearts, what I was asking you to do was essentially slow down. You have a lot to do today. There's probably things you have to get to that are maybe causing you a little bit of anxiety. But the hope is by slowing down, you can not only see more clearly, feel more clearly, but also be less anxious and, and less stressed out. And that, that's kind of like the beauty of what I'm trying to get at here. And they've done studies on mindfulness and studies on meditation and studies on trying to be present in the moment. And these studies have all shown that they actually rewire your brains. We have grooves in our brains, as you probably know. And in those grooves um, are essentially the result of how we habitually react to things. Um, and by causing um, our neural pathways to shift into this slow down kind of path, um, the brain shifts and adopts this kind of um, mentality, and it actually makes you be less stressed and less anxious. Um, another tip that I, I want to share with you is um, the one that involves gratitude. This is something that I, I know that I really needed to work on just because uh, it's so easy to take things for granted. And then I know I have in my life. It's so, it's so easy to be blessed with so many things. And in, in all those things, not think about like, wow, that's incredible that I have this. Like, for example, I can see, I can see the screen. That's incredible. I can hear, I can only hear myself talk, but when um, the person earlier from Pakistan spoke, I heard him too. That's to me, that's, that's incredible. And I never used to think about that before, how, how awesome that is. And so when you look at things from the viewpoint of gratitude, everything shifts and it shifts into um, basically slowing down. And one of the words, um, I, I, I love words because I'm a writer. So I always like to look up the root words of things. So the word um, um, thanks um, comes from, the root word comes from to think or to know, which is really interesting when you think about that. Um, and, and so what does that mean? Um, how does that relate to thank you? Well, if you're thinking about something and, and you understand um, why something happened or, or why someone did something for you, you, like you know why they did it, then all of a sudden, um, you're thankful for why they did that. And so that's, that's where the root word of thank you comes from. It comes from the Latin word, and I'm probably going to mangle, mangle it, tangere, but that essentially is, is that root meaning. And so once I understood that, um, to think, and again, thinking um, in the present moment just basically means being open to whatever is placed in front of you um, and just being grateful for it. And so um, I had alluded earlier to, to um, something in 2018, um, which has shifted my life in terms of my gratitude, my levels of gratitude. So this is a picture of me with my family. That's my daughter, Alexis, and my wife, Jill. Um, so in 2018, something really profound happened. And it, it's really sad, actually. Um, my wife, um, was diagnosed with something called Huntington's disease. And if you're not familiar with that disease, imagine, and this is the way they commonly describe it. Imagine a combination, if you have a combination of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, or ALS, and ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. So imagine having those three things in one disease. That's what she has. It runs in her father's family. Um, he had it, that's what he died of. Multiple people on his side of the family had, a, had it, which is what they died of. And when you're related to someone who has it, no if, ands, or buts, genetically speaking, you have a 50% chance of getting it. So she always knew that she had a 50% chance. 
So in 2018, she started showing symptoms and uh, one of them is twitching because essentially what this uh, rare terminal illness is, it's a neurodegenerative disease. And what it does is it attacks the nervous system and it attacks the brain too. And what it does to the brain is it makes you psychotic. What it does to your muscles is your nervous system is it makes you lose control of your muscles. And so that's one of the reasons why people with Huntington start twitching like this, even though they can't help it, they can't control it. And so she has muscles here. We all do, obviously. And at a certain point, she won't be able to control her swallowing. She won't be able to eat food, in other words. And so oftentimes you look at Huntington's patients and they end up looking like Holocaust victims because whatever weight they had can't be sustained because they can't eat. And so oftentimes they end up having a G2, but even that's not enough to keep up their sustaining them. So it's a kind of a horrific um, disease to have. And then 2019, our, if, and again, if you're related to someone, so our daughter, who's obviously related to her mother, um, if you're related, 50% chance. So in 2019, right before she was about to graduate from MIT, so bright young woman, great future ahead of her, she was diagnosed as being gene positive for the disease. So both of the people whom I love the most in my world have this horrific rare illness for which there is no cure at the moment. Um, so in understanding the devastation of that, um, I just said to myself, if I project too much into the future, I, I honestly believe my head would explode because the thought of them going through all that, me seeing that um, and knowing how they are, they're brilliant people, knowing their brains are gonna be turned into mush, um, is, is just too much. It's just too much for me to handle, basically. And so I said to myself, I needed to handle it by trying to figure out a way to deal. And so one of the ways that I figured out was to learn how to live in the present moment, because that way, I don't think about what they're going to go through. I will concentrate on what I need to do in that moment. And I won't be bogged down by all the wounds of my past um, that have happened to me that prevent me from being a good person. And so if I just figure out how to be here and figure out how to be present to them in ways that I may not have been before, because I wasn't conscious of, of trying to be a human being rather than a human doing, not only do they deserve that, but I deserve that in terms of my stress and my anxiety levels. And so with that in mind, I've set out daily for the past three years of doing everything that I've shared with you, basically. And so um, one, of the, one of the reasons why this is important for all of us, because the name of this conference is called CARE. And so I, again, looking up the root words, as you can see from the root word of CARE, it means grief or sorrow. And so in caring for them, um, I, I could be filled with grief or sorrow, right? Um, and, and obviously that's a very human kind of reaction to when you see someone suffering. And I know that a lot of you probably encounter suffering in your line of work. Um, and of course, you know, concentrating attention on them, which is what this word now means, it makes sense too. Um, but but um, ultimately, um, what I try to do in my care is to translate that grief or sorrow into something where I'm filled with gratitude um, because they are in my life. And if, if they're a diminished version of themselves, they're still in my life. And what I, what I hope to do through my care is to express to them the love that I feel in my heart. And that can be blocked by anxiety or stress or worry. And I want to eliminate that so that my heart, and again, that's that image that I had earlier, my heart is so free and so pure and so big that what goes out to them is what they deserve, which is incredible love, incredible um, patience, incredible kindness. And that takes a lot of energy. And in order to harness that energy, I need to be present to them. I need to figure out what is the duty of the moment that I need to do in order to care for them and to help them overcome whatever it is that they need to do as their caregivers. 
and to show them the love that they need. And so um, I started this with Mr. Rogers and I kind of want to end this with him. So in this great dialogue from the movie, um, he talks about with that reporter that I mentioned, and, and I'll kind of quote it here a little bit. Um, he says on our program, and he's talking about his show, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, he tries to look at the camera at a single child and speak to that person and notice that he says to be fully present. And if anyone who's seen the show or, or knows of his story, I believe that that guy worked hard on being fully present. And so he says in this conversation, you know what the most important thing in the world is to me right now? And the reporter says, no, he says talking on the phone. So Fred Rogers duty of the moment at that moment was to talk to that reporter. And that's the only thing that he was worried about he did, he was doing his duty. He wasn't thinking about stuff that he needed to do. He wasn't thinking about um, anything that happened in the past. He just was fully present with his heart. And that's the purpose of this is to rediscover our hearts, find that time to listen to your heartbeat, to take that silence. And of course, you know, we do have to deal with the future. It's going to happen, right? Moment to moment, that future is going to occur. Um, and so obviously what we do right now, eliminating our stress or anxiety as our worries, um, trying to be fully present, trying to love people the best way possible um, will depend on what we do right this second. And right this second, I say to you, be present. So um, any questions or comments? I'm more than happy to answer anything from you all. Thank you for your attention, by the way. Yeah, feel free to post any questions in the chat room. We do have nine minutes left in your workshop, Carlos. Yep. And I wonder about diagnosis day for you. So when your wife received the diagnosis, I wonder what that moment was like and what suggestions you would give for another who has that moment when they hear a really difficult and devastating diagnosis? Well, that's a great question, Denise. You got to realize that um, prior to that moment, um, there had been months beforehand where we, I had been observing um, her changes in her and, and the twitching, they're called koreas, which is eye movement, basically. And basically what that means is, is her eyes were going like this. She didn't realize it, but they were doing that. I had been noticing that and I didn't want to scare her, you know, and I noticed that her toes were twitching like this. They were wiggling like that when she was sitting in a chair. Um, and, um, you know, how do you say to somebody like, you know, dear, I think what you saw your father, what, how you, the years that you took care of your father um, and saw him diminish, like I'm going to be doing for you. And you saw how he ended up. There was a six foot four guy who ended up when he died, a hundred pounds. He did not weigh a hundred pounds when he was fully, you know, you know, before, before the disease started to, to take away his ability to eat. Um, he was a healthy man. So, so I had months of preparation before that, but to be honest, I hadn't had months of trying to figure out how to live in the, in the moment. So when that um, verdict came in that doctor's office. There were there were several people present. There was a social worker, there was a neurologist, and there was a doctor. And of course, my wife and me. Um, I projected, <laughs> you know, and and I got really scared. Uh, honestly, I got really, really, really scared. And of course, I was really sad. I mean, there were a lot of tears. Um, but like I said earlier, my goal is to eliminate things so that my heart gets so big that they deserve the best and they deserve so much heart because they're such great people and are so loving that they deserve the utmost kindness, the utmost patience, the utmost love. And the only way to clear the, my heart of my junk, and believe me, I have a lot of junk there, stuff that I've weighed me down from the past. Um, I alluded to woundedness, which, which everyone has, um, unforgiveness that I've had in my past, all that weighs me down that I've thought of. I said, I can't do that. And so one of the ways that I've learned how to heal is to be present. And in doing that, my heart has gone like this. And in doing that, I'm able to be 
do whatever I need to do in the duty of the moment, basically. So yes, it was really hard. Um, but I say start now to be present so that when it happens to you that you deal with that, um, you're going to be not freaking out. You're going to be like I was in the car. I swear to you, I was totally at peace when that deer hit and the, and after the deer. Hit. It was crazy how much at peace I was. Yeah, what, a, what strikes me is that the present moment gives us a chance to take care of our past so that we can be fully present in our moment. And I love the analogy you talk about the junk in your heart. <laughs> the junk in our heart does close our heart. It, it does. does make it smaller. I love that. I'm going to remember that. And then taking care of that junk is the way that we open up our heart so that right. we can receive more. Exactly. And, you know, I, the reason why I use that word, I, I looked up that word care to see what it originally meant, grief and sorrow, like that could weigh your heart, basically, because you're projecting basically like all the grief you're going to feel, all the sorrow you're going to feel. And honestly, like years from now, when, when, and, and, you know, honestly, like I may die tomorrow, I may die, you know, next week, like my sister was there. And then the next second, she wasn't like that, that could happen to anyone. Uh, as a friend of mine points out, um, you know, we're all terminal. <laughs> if my wife is not the only terminal person here, like you were all terminal. Um, but ultimately, like that grief and sorrow, which which is normal, it's very human, um, which is a projection of like all the sadness I'm going to feel. And, and I know I'm going to be sad when they die. Of course I am. But if I'm fully present, I'm going to be storing up all that stuff from moment to moment to moment. So instead of instead of my heart being filled with, with all that stuff um, for the future, it's filled with all the unbelievable stuff that's happening in this moment where I'm listening to them, where I'm looking at them, where I'm feeling them. And in, in doing that, those, that's a storehouse. That's like a terabyte, a trillion terabyte of, 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 of memories that when they do die, I'm gonna just go back and go, and of course, like I'm gonna be looking at the past but it's going to be in the present. They're go I'm going to carry them in my present of, of all that love that I felt for them moment to moment to moment. Because as you know, when you love someone, they're there. They're always there. But it will be there in such a profound way that it'll be mind blowing, but in a good way, not the mind blowing of scared about the future. Yeah, Jody is sharing in the chat room around yeah. this idea around anticipatory grief. And I had the same thought when Jody typed that in the chat room that sometimes we do, and your word project is perfect, project the loss in the future onto the moment in today. And what happens then is that we've stolen that present moment to be with our family members. Exactly. But here's the interesting thing, especially I learned this from my both sisters dying too young, one sister at 45, the other one at 59. Um, is that what if, God forbid, you die tomorrow? My point being that you've anticipated this grief for someone else. And so you've wasted all this time from now until tomorrow. Let's say if you die, die tomorrow, God forbid, any of us do. Um, you've wasted all that time thinking about something that never happened because you, you're dead before them. <laughs> Yeah, it's this idea too that the present moment gives us this opportunity to tell people how important they are to us to create the memories for them and for ourselves that we can really draw comfort from in the future. And not only that, but but discovering what the blessings are, because there's always blessings, even if there's horrific stuff happening in the present moment, there's still blessings. And that's where the gratitude comes in. So again, you're filling your heart, not with junk, but with good stuff. And again, when you feel that, what happens in your brain is you're freeing up your hard drive, basically, to be fully present, to be fully um, loving, to be fully caring, not with grief, but with, with just your full heart. And, and that's, that's, that's such a, your full heart being just total love. And that's the purpose of caring, I believe. Yeah, I love this idea that we have a choice about what fills our heart. And it could be the junk, which is unforgiveness and pain and connecting to the unfairness of life, because that can really fill us with resentment and bitterness. And instead deciding, 
deciding I'm going to fill my heart with love yep. and gratitude. And, and really the last tip that I have to say is this takes time. This does not happen overnight. It's a daily thing. It's literally a minute to minute thing. Um, and of course we're human. Sometimes we regress, which is normal and that's okay. Like no one's going to perfectly do this. Um, but, but at the same time, my point is, is try it because the more you do it, the better you get at it. It's habits are formed by habit. So form that habit. Okay, thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you so, all. So appreciate your courage in sharing your story and your hope in sharing your strategies. To thank man. you guys. I, I came to you like this, so I hope we leave like this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. So everybody feel free to take a refresher break and we'll see you back here at top of the hour. <laughs>